Hello, welcome back to the ministry and we're picking up with part three of the Patricia and Gavin Agnew and in why did I get married? So we are now at the point which Patricia made the choice. I call a divorce. Now I went to look up the scripture that I couldn't find before and I looked through, I found a bunch of Bible verses and it was none of the, none of them were the verse I was looking for. I was looking for some, a particular verse and I couldn't find it. So I don't know what that was. So we're going to blood and but I know the scripture I was looking for. I just, I could not find that particular translation. Mm. Um, if I find it, it'll come up, but Patricia decided in order to maintain control, I'm going to push the people away. Meaning, number one, I'm going to push my husband away. I'm going to call for a divorce. Now, one might say that's a drastic thing if you just do. She was dealing with avoidance. And it was piling up to a degree that was bringing about a level of disconcertingness between her and her husband. Because her husband's trying to talk to her. But she refuses to open herself up to the pain in which she would need to feel in order to move past that point. I'm sorry to say this to all y'all people. If you haven't realized it, especially those of you standing for your kingdom marriage, pain is necessary in order for you to reach your breakthrough. The pain of being broken yourself in order for you to realize the parts of you that need to be healed. Avoidance is not going to help you heal those places. It's not. You have to face yourself. And the number one thing that God always does is he's going to show you you before he shows you anybody else. You first, anybody else come second. You first. You first. Nobody else. You first. Check in with self. And the fact of the matter was, because she's perfect Patty and because she does this for a living, she felt that she was doing all that she needed to do. But she was only doing the surface work. And everybody was trying to get her to delve into the deeper part. Do we know? It could have been something that happened as she was growing up. A certain type of thing. If she believes that she's a perfect Patty, nine times out of ten, she was an overachiever in school. She felt that she had to always be successful in order to gain continual accolades she lived in a a a level of pride within self that may have come from parents and as a black woman that works in that type of field that she worked in nine times out of ten she was more than likely trying to maintain a persona with everyone because she'd probably been doing that ever since she was a child. I do what my parents say because that's what gets the accolades from my parents. I do what this says and uh, that, is, that gets the accolade. And in order for me to be satisfied, I'm not allowed to feel emotions. Because I put everyone above me. I put everyone before me. I put everyone blah, blah, blah. So because of that, something that happened when she was a child, more than likely she was reared up in it between the ages of five through adulthood that led her to even going into the career choices in which she made. And... She began to come to the realization, if I act this way, everything's going to work this way. And she became perfect Patty. So she created um, 
is actually an attachment style, to be honest with you, that um, she had to be this way. Let me see the eight. Let me see if I can find the attachment style. Okay, I figured out what attachment style that she is. She is actually, I believe it's avoidant attachment can develop if a child or a child's parents or caregivers are emotionally unavailable and unresponsive over time it can cause the child to stop seeking connection or expressing emotions this is what patricia was um So it was probably something that went on with her childhood in relation to creating avoidant attachment. So she avoids dealing with emotional trauma. So she feels overwhelmed and anxious to confront emotional needs and closes herself off emotionally. There you go. That's exactly what she is. I might come back to those because there are some other ones that we can discuss as well. But that's the type of attachment style that she has which she avoids all issues. And as we go further, you're going to determine or discover how this is not helping the situation at all. So she calls for, I called for a divorce is what she says. So everybody goes back after the vacation and everybody's concerned. What's going on with Patricia? Anybody heard from Patricia? Patricia, okay. So you go back and they check and Patricia's in the house, but she ain't answering the door. For her to, in order to be avoidant, she can't answer the door. Okay. She must avoid. They come check on her. She won't answer the door. She's sitting right there in the living room. She won't answer the door because she's not dealing with her emotions. Okay. So Terry and Gavin decide one day that they're going to go over there and they're going to come in. Gavin needs to get his stuff. Terry thinks that, uh... She know that they coming. See, it's a known fact that because she the type of person that she is, she has a flip switch on her. They actually discussed the flip switch on her. Something that happened with Gavin in high school. I mean, high school, college. When they were in college. She... And I believe it was, um, what's her name? Uh, Tasha? I think her name was Tasha. I, I cannot think of the, uh, the other one's name. This is Mary DeMarcus. But, um, they ended up in a situation, it was a vehicle, I think they keyed up the car, they either keyed up the car, they, they broke out the windows with a bat. But Patricia was involved in that. And they were like, y'all remember how Patricia was in college? Basically meaning, she's been a quiet problem. Meaning, let's not deal with her emotions because it's like, let's not poke that bear. Let's not deal with it. Some of us, blessed be to Jesus for us to having found God. But in us having found God, we kind of put away either our former man 
or a part of us that lie dormant. As a child of God, some of you have a dormant side. There are some people that have a boldness about them. They just freely show it. Others, they don't know how to handle that side. So in order to deal with that emotion and not go there, they don't deal with their emotions at all. But the problem in that is eventually it's going to push them to that side by avoiding it. So Gavin comes to the house. He needs to get his stuff. He's like, I'm going to get my stuff. Terry said, I'm going to come help you. And he's like, wait, you, you didn't tell her we were coming? With recognition. Wait, we remember what happened in college when she was pissed off. And from my understanding, she mad. What you mean? We just. So he's like, I just came to get my stuff. And he went, he busted the front door open. Broke the glass out and everything. And Terry's like, oh my God. Oh, she ain't in there because we, we about to die. Because he know that her other side which we have not seen up until this point, is dangerous. They come in the house, and Gavin goes upstairs, grabs his bag, grabs his, his golf club, grabs something else. And Terry's standing, standing in the middle of the floor like, Yo, I didn't ask for, I can't, I'm just, I don't, I, I won't be here when Patricia come back. What you mean you didn't tell her that we was coming? Oh my God, I don't know. I hope she ain't here and then she come back and then he's standing there and they having a conversation and Patricia come up like Nightmare on Elm Street because <laughs> she's straight standing there looking like I can massacre somebody in a minute. See, the problem with us control people, we don't like being taken out of our control set. Because if we no longer feel like we have control, stand the reason, we're going to flip to the opposite side of ourselves. All the way. And she was in a all the way opposite side of herself. You could see it. She looked like Nightmare on Elm Street. She's like standing there in sweats, hair looking disheveled, long hair looking disheveled, looking like, what the heck do you think you're doing? And then you come to find out, Gavin had taken all of her money from out of her bank account. And he arguing with her while Terry's standing there like, I'm going to get out of here because I don't, I don't. He, she's like, where my money at? He said, I took it. I took everything in relation to that book because I helped you write half of that book. Half of the stuff was inspired by me. So I'm going to take half the money. She's like, that was my money. And she picks up a golf club and starts. Breaking everything. See, the thing that people don't seem to understand is this. When you have a person that is calm, 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 calm. There's always an underlying side of them that sits there. And it's, for us children of God, it's the blood of Jesus that keeps that person underneath the surface. It's like, stay under there. Stay under there. You got to push them down all the time. Stay under there. Push them down. Stay under there. Stay down there. Because if you come out, this could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, and you always keep that, that underside. You keep that thing under wraps. You keep that thing. Keep it down there. Keep it down there. It'll be all right. But eventually, at some particular point in time, when the emotions are not dealt with, and you reach your breaking point, 
You're either going to talk about it or you're going to have an emotional mental break. She had a mental break where she decided, I'm going to take these golf clubs. I'm going to beat this whole house up. I'm going to break every piece of glass. I'm going to break everything. She's like, give me my stuff. We as children of God have a tendency to do this in the spirit realm. We go in the spirit and we tear up everything. <laughs> but she was physically tearing up everything. And they turned around and they got out of there. After Terry saw what happened, he went and got Diane, told Diane to go over there with the girls. They found her sitting on on um, steps and catatonic. And they went and instead of having a conversation with her, knowing that she's not one to talk, they just came around her and hugged her. Every person finding a spot that they could hug on a part of her body and just held her. And she was still not dealing with the emotion. Because she refused to deal with the emotion of it. She didn't break down with them. She just sat there. So, with all that had occurred... Um... There was another part. And I don't know if this happened before or after. But um, I think it happened before. Uh, Patricia. Yeah, this was before she had her break. Rewind. We're going to rewind a bit. To the part where she and Gavin were still living in the house together in relation to um was it before or after I'm not sure because I remember she was it must have been before because she hadn't had her break yet and started acting foolish and letting not allowing anybody in the house she was talking about how they were going to go about the process of the divorce and he was going around the house drinking. She had triggered him to start to deal with his emotions by avoidance as well. And his avoidance was to drink liquor in uh, response to her not talking to him. And he now was emotionally distressed and talking to her through his alcoholic stupor. And she still didn't want to talk. She's like, I'm not going to talk to you because you're drunk. And this ticked him off. He said, okay, let's talk. And so it comes right back to their exact same issue, the little boy. She not dealing with the emotion of the loss of their son. We thought she had dealt with it in part one and that they had had a break that caused her to start dealing with her emotions. She had not. She was still operating in emotional avoidance. So she's trying to separate the assets for the divorce and they end up in a major fight that causes her to... Um, end up freaking out about something and he went and grabbed the book with all the son's pictures and he's like okay so since you don't care about him no more we might as well just get rid of these and she said no 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 no, no. and he starts to burn the pictures which showed she still had feelings but she was not dealing with the feelings she was keeping idols. 
She was keeping the photographs. And I mean, we keep our photos. If you lost a child, you would keep your photos. But she wasn't dealing with it. She wouldn't look at it with him. She would not sit and talk to him about it. But when he threatened the pictures, she freaked out and he grabbed her and then they ended up in a physical fight. This is what emotional avoidance will cause for you because he was trying to get through to her. He was trying to shake some sense into her and then they ended up falling back on the couch and she, she's crying and uh, he bit her face. I don't know why he bit her because I guess he called himself with, if you won't feel pain, maybe if I cause you pain, you might feel the pain. I don't know what that was, but this was a whole lot of avoided emotions culminating in one moment. Okay. And he was freaking out and attacked her. Then he up and left, which I believe was what happened just before all the confusion had occurred. But I'm trying to think, was it before or after? Because if he had bit her face, I think that there would have been some issue in relation to talking to Terry about it and bringing Terry back over there. So I can't remember whether that happened before or after. But she was sitting there one day and she just was smoking a cigarette and she was just in the dark. Not dealing with their emotions. Some of us are isolators. Being an isolator, we have the tendency not to want to deal with emotions. We rather isolate in order to avoid dealing with other people and their emotions and so on and so forth. So she was isolating herself because I'm still not going to talk about this situation. No matter how bad it has gotten, she's still emotionally avoidant. So they eventually end up getting to a point where they get themselves together and they end up in the divorce lawyer's office and they're talking about the splitting up of the assets. This must have come before. I think, I, I think I'm explaining it out of order, but irregardless you still understand that um, she's not allowing him to have access to certain things in relation to her funds, which we later find that he takes. So I'm assuming that the way that this originally went they had went to the divorce lawyer. Uh, Diane represented her in the divorce while he had his own lawyer. And um, Terry only went after the huge blow up between the two of them. And he was like, Oh, you, you didn't tell her we were coming. So that happened in three different, in three different sets. It was the discussion of the divorce, him drinking and biting her in the face and burning the pictures of the baby. Then he left, then him coming back because he needed to get his bag of stuff. And them coming to try and calm her down. So, with that being said, 
she came to the realization that she wasn't going to be made no fool of. I do not know when in differentiation differentiation of time, but some time had passed because she had actually slimmed herself down because she looked like she had gained weight at the point in time in which she busted the house up. But now she looking fit and fine. <laughs> she comes in in the best suit. That suit was altogether lovely. <laughs> And she comes in to fully embarrass her husband. Comes into his job, thoroughly embarrasses him by bringing somebody in there in a cape. And it was a dude dressed up like a chick and said that you a wimp. So I'm going to bring you your queen. (laughs) So they end up publicly having an embarrassing moment at his job and he's like I can't believe you're doing this Patricia what in the world is which leads them to end up outside arguing and while they out there arguing he's like you know what I ain't gonna deal with you because she called him all kinds of names because she had the point now she's willing to talk now she's in a mode of, instead of talking calmly, she's acting out of aggression. Because sometimes when you are an avoidant of argument, when you hit your uh, point of actually dealing with the conversation, instead of still actually dealing with it from a calm place, you come from a place of, I'm going to be loud, I'm going to be great, I'm going to be... be- and because you're still being avoidant, you just you're just doing it from a completely different position. Meaning you're gonna deflect, scream, yell, be loud. This is what we see the Jezebelic spirit do. And she starts calling him all kinds of names and embarrassing him. And he get he jumps in the car and he's like, I ain't even talking to you. And he rides off, he pissed off, he wasn't even paying attention, and a mat truck. Busted his car up, flipped it over, and took that car out. It was like, bam, sudden. Which leaves her going to the hospital, and they trying to find out if he alive or not. Which comes to find out that he passed away. And all of this could have been avoided if the two of them had sat down and communicated. Not surface, real. But she was operating in the avoidant attachment style and would rather avoid, which led them down a much deeper and darker hole that when you avoid dealing with your pain, you create a bigger wound. Some of you have been wondering why the Lord has not opened up the door for certain relationships and things to come into your life. Why are you still in this feels like purgatory? Why does it feel like you haven't opened it? Because God is like, I need to still circumcise that residue. It's in your heart to make sure that everything is clear because those parts of you, if I let you into this new relationship that I'm planning to open the door to for you, there are going to be certain things that are going to come up. And one, if those things come up in the relationship that you're going into, you're going to hurt that man. Because he very well that if you flip on him, it could actually cause him more damage, more harm. And you could actually cause him more pain because he loves you in a way that you don't understand. And look at what happened. This is why I said in about the film Disenchanted. Make sure that you don't become the Jezebel. Don't become the very thing that you are trying not to become. 
There's a way that seems right to a man, the end thereof is death. That moment in which he got hit by a car, suddenly his life was over. And now she had to deal with herself. Really deal with herself. Because not only now had she lost her son, she had to deal with the fact that she caused the death of her husband too. She had to deal with that fact. And they went back to the island to release his ashes. And she was distraught. It was it was a distressing situation. But there was a silver lining. After all of the healing, after all of that stuff was dealt with. We see the silver lining. Because I forget how much time had passed. I don't know whether it was a year, 18 months, six months. I don't know how much time had passed. But some time had passed. She's coming out the office. She's in her. Her body's looking good. She looking good. Everybody's like, Professor Agnew, you're in such good spirit. She's like, oh, yes. And here comes the rock. And she looked like. Oh my goodness. I guess we're going to have to question Tyler Perry on. Are we getting, why are you getting married again? Because we, we wonder. He gave us the poster. But we ain't heard no more about that film. I don't know. But this is Patricia. And Gavin. So we're going to come back for the next one. <laughs>